Hey everyone, it's Ratitude time. <laughs> and uh, I, I love these podcasts. This is, I think, my uh, sixth or seventh. It's probably my seventh one because seven's my lucky number, right? Today is uh, September 7th when I'm recording it. And uh, I know you won't hear this one, see this one for probably another month, but I'm recording it on September 7th. And truthfully, September 7th is a is a big day or an important day or a memorable day. I don't know what kind of day to call it. It was uh, 14 years ago today that my dad tragically died. And so I guess, well, okay, that's going to make me sad. <laughs> I don't want to go sad. Um, because among the stories that I want to talk about today, and today's theme is about living rad. And what does that mean? I had to figure it out because I'm writing a book for a chapter and it's called Living Rad and Loving Contagiously. And in a previous episode, I talked about loving contagiously. So I thought, huh, I better talk about living rad now too. And as I was writing my chapter, um, all sorts of things came up to me about living rad. And uh, first, I'll tell you kind of where it came from, because it's kind of a cool story, too. So um, in my second career, my first career was a chemical engineer for Exxon. My second one was as the head track and field and cross country coach for uh, Pepperdine University. And there I went there because I was going to win some national championships. It never occurred to me that I wouldn't build the greatest track and cross country program in the history of the universe. We had this beautiful track on a cliff overlooking the ocean. And uh, unfortunately, there was minimal scholarships, if any. I think I had 0.4. And uh, we were Division One, so competing against Oregon, Arkansas, Wisconsin, Colorado, the big time programs. Um, and I had an eight lane track and no field events. And after a few years, they actually took out the inside four lanes of my track. So I had a four lane track, but it was lanes five through eight. So there's a lot of things going against me, but you know that's kind of where I go. Is uh, it's it's got to be hard, or I'm not going to do it. I'm trying to get out of that, but that's the way I've been, and that's the way life has shown up for me. But anyway, I was in the Tony Robbins world at that time and had uh, joined the Platinum Partners. And you know, back then there weren't that many Platinum Partners like there is today. I think there's over two thousand, but back then I think it was like three to five hundred or so. And some of the events you actually could get a little bit close to Tony and talk to him. And somehow he knew uh, that I was coaching at Pepperdine University. We had a chance to chat once. And I said, gosh, I got to raise like $2 million, something like that per year in order to really fund my team, the scholarships and the travel and the uniforms and all the cool stuff that I really wanted to be, to do to build a national championship. And he looked at me and he says, you know, the only way I could think to do that in the kind of time frame that you're talking about is to find some kind of network marketing company, an MLM that you're passionate about and that it's in its early stages in the startup because that's when you can make a bunch of money. I didn't really even know what network marketing was at that time, but uh, this was at a financial seminar, wealth seminar, something like that, and they explained what it was, and then I kind of got it. You know, I've had friends in Herbalife and, you know, not friends, but I knew of Avon and Tupperware and some of those kinds of things that are big name brands, and at this event, it was like 50% of all the Platinum Partners were in some kind of MLM, and they were making more in a month than I did in a year. I go, huh, I don't know about this. I came from the corporate world. I thought that's the way you're supposed to go. But um, I took that advice and said, okay, I, I was so passionate about building a championship program. I had to do it. I was willing to do anything and I was trying everything to do, but this was a new one. And so I go, okay, I got to find something I'm passionate about and that it's early on in the uh, um, startup phase or uh, pre-launch, they call it pre-launch. <laughs> I love the words that I picked up in the uh, MLM world. Anyway, um, I, I, didn't really go out looking. It just came to me. I think because I was vibrating so high and, you know, that's the law of attraction. When you're vibrating high, things just, you attract things. And I think that's what happened. This was in December and a friend of mine that I had met, his name is Cliff Braun. 
Um, he lives in Costa, no, Colombia. Columbia, kind of part-time. He travels most of the time. He's like a cool dude. He's been a big-time MLM person. He's written two best-selling books. Uh, when he was 24, I think he started uh, network marketing at 19. All his friends went to college. He went to network marketing by 24. He and his brother bought like 14 Lamborghinis just because they could. I tell that story, but he said it was only one or two. <laughs> but I'm saying it's 14 because the story sounds way better. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, I saw that he had posted a picture of himself sipping a little espresso in Malibu, where I was living. And he, it, it was something like, I'm in Malibu um, sipping uh, an espresso. If anyone's around, come have coffee with me. I don't drink coffee, but I, I quickly contacted him. Hey, I live in Malibu. We should get together. And he said, great. Um, when do you want to get together? Because I'm leaving on December 31st. Oh, 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 this is part of the story. I was in Puerto Vallarta at the time when I saw that. And I said, dang, I'm not getting back till January 2nd or something like that. And he goes, ah, too bad. Uh, maybe next time. So I didn't think much about it. And then a couple of days later, still before uh, December 31st, he sends me a note saying, hey, um, it turns out my passport has expired, not expired. He had he had uh, um, taken up all his pages in his passport because he travels so much and he had to go get a new passport. But he had to have it right away because he needed to go to Colombia um, because I guess for New Year's, for some reason, I don't know, he was just going home. And he needed it like in one day because he just figured this out. So he went down to that passport agency office on Wilshire Boulevard near UCLA in Los Angeles for people that uh, live in Southern California. You probably know where it is for others. You have no clue. <laughs> anyway, he went down there and uh, he's filling out the paperwork, giving their passport. And they said, hey, uh, we can't give you a new passport. And he said, why? Because there's a, a block or a hold or a uh, inquiry into you. Um, it looks like you haven't paid your taxes. And he goes, how could that be? And uh, so he called up his accountant to find out about it. And the accountant said, yep, we got all the documentation. Let's go down and show him. I could show him. Um, oh, we need to go to the IRS. Um, so they, they went down to the IRS office. And there was a sign there saying the IRS is closed because of the government shutdown because the president at that time um, didn't, uh, he vetoed some kind of funding bill that had stuff in it that he didn't like. So he vetoed the bill. And so the IRS office was closed. So Cliff couldn't get his um, passport renewed. So he couldn't leave the country. So he had to be here. And so we got together. All those things had to happen in order for us to get together. So I remember we got together on January 6th, as day before my birthday, or maybe it was January 5th. Anyway, we got together at this little uh, uh, restaurant in Malibu called Marmalade, and we're just talking, catching up. And all of a sudden he says, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to this, this meeting, um, a network marketing company about travel. And bing, 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 bing. I thought, ho. Oh, Tony Robbins is talking to me. He says, look for a network marketing company that's in pre-launch that you're passionate about. Travel, it's a pre-launch meeting and it's happening. And so I go, hey, that sounds really cool. Tell me more about it. So he told me a little bit about it. There's like 30 people in it. It's just starting. And I said, well, come, can I come to that meeting? I told him about my story with Tony Robbins. And he goes, yeah, I don't know. They just want influencers. And I said, well, what's an influencer? And he said, um, well, they told me you have to have like 300,000 followers. <laughs> and I had about 100 or something like that. But he goes, hold on, let me call my friend Matt. I didn't know Matt at that time. Now he's a good friend also. But he calls Matt and he says, hey, I got this guy here. His name is Robert Redhody. Um, he's the track coach at Pepperdine University. He wants to come to this meeting. What do you think? And Matt goes, so he's a track coach at Pepperdine University. Then he must have influencers, right? Invite him. So Cliff goes, okay, you're invited. <laughs> so uh, I got invited to a travel networking marketing company. I'm passionate about travel. And it's in pre-launch. There's only 30 people in it. 
So they gave me the address to go. It was in Pacific Palisades. So I drove my, my little, I think that time I was driving a truck, <laughs> probably an old truck. And I remember pulling up to this place with these giant, beautiful, like gold gates. And, you know, it was a, a, um, a, a gated community and you had to have the code to get in. And I'm seeing that uh, the cars in front of me are like Lamborghinis and Ferraris and behind me are Mercedes and BMWs, all these really nice cars. And I've got my little truck. <laughs> um, anyway, they let me in and I got into this meeting and, uh, you know, I always like to come back to the, uh, the book I read 25, 30 years ago, Celestine Prophecy by uh, James Redfield. If you haven't read it, read it. It's like really cool. It's about uh, um, opening up your eyes, your ears, your mind, everything to the clues that are coming at you in life because they're always coming at you. And as you wake up, if you be, as you become more conscious of your unconscious, uh, think about what you're thinking about, see what you're not seeing because we don't mostly see a lot of stuff or hear or feel, or sense, or taste, or touch, or any of those feelings, or senses. Um, but when you do, there's magic all around you. And so we sat down for this presentation. There's maybe, I don't know, 50 plus people there. And I know I met some of them, mostly young people. One, one girl I met, she was like some kind of YouTuber or Twitter person that had like 3 million followers. So I'm sitting there going, I got like 100 <laughs> I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. Anyway, I sat there and, and Cliff was on one side, Matt was on the other side. That was when I, I first met Matt. Um, and we're starting to listen to his presentation. It's this guy named Blake Mallon is, is presenting. And I'm looking at him and going like, that guy looks really familiar to me. And I looked at the brochure, Blake Mallon. I don't know who that is, um, but I know an Alex Mallon, she is a she was our uh, representative at Pepperdine University where uh, uh, she was the merchandise rep so she would come in and the coaches would meet her twice a year um, and she would bring the uh, catalogs and samples from Nike Adidas um, all the different manufacturers and we get to pick what we wanted to uh, purchase for the year her name's Alex Mallon. She's like one of the coolest people I've ever met. Just kind, loving, just a beautiful soul. And so I text her in the middle of this presentation and said, hey, Alex, do you know this guy named Blake? And she texts back and he goes, yeah, that's my brother. And I go, oh, oh that makes sense why he looks so familiar. He looks just like you. And she said, yeah, he does. And I guess there was some in his stories, he was talking about Thousand Oaks and, and just kind of growing up in this local area. So those all kind of triggered in my mind. I know someone here. Oh, yeah, Alex Mallon. And so I ask her, you know, is he a good guy? Are you involved with this live thing? And she goes, yeah, uh, you know, Blake signs me up for everything uh, he ever does and makes a lot of money. But I don't know what it is. And I just said, is he a good guy? Is he like you? And she goes, yeah, he's a good guy. So I go, OK, that's all I need to know, because um, it's travel. It's pre-launch. And the leader is at least a cool guy, according to his brother, her sister. <laughs> <laughs> so in the middle of this, you know, you got to sign up. The sign up is like 99 bucks or something like that. That's really cheap to get into network marketing. And so Matt's on one side of me and he's signing up on his phone. As soon as he signs up, he gives it to Cliff and Cliff signs up. It takes 30 seconds to sign up. Cliff signs up and then Cliff gives it to me. So I sign up. So 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute and a half. We're all signed up for live and it's live L I V period. That was what it was. And then you would add on to it whatever you wanted to add. So I, of course, had live, L-I-V, period, rad, R-A-D, live rad. And I've added a little N since. But that's where live and rad came from is network marketing. And I, I since then, have become really good friends with both Cliff and Matt and uh, visited both of them in uh, Colombia for Cliff, uh, Matt in Las Vegas and Costa Rica. And we even did this. <laughs> 
this funny uh, car rally in Europe that is like, had to be like cannonball too with the crazy things that happened. Um, if I run into you someplace, ask me the stories about that because it was just wild. Um, and just like cannonball rally, if that's what it was with Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise and just crazy things as they raced across the United States. We raced from uh, London to Paris, to Geneva, to Monte Carlo, to Barcelona, to Valencia, to Ibiza. Um, <laughs> and, and these crazy cars that were supposedly owned by a guy named Virtue, who <laughs> had no virtues. <laughs> um, anyway, that's a different story. So that's where Live and Rad came from. And I just added the N because, oh, that was my license plate, Run and Rad. So it's now Live and Rad. So, uh, a few days ago, I'm writing this chapter, uh, for my book on, uh, for entrepreneurs. I'm going to be speaking in Hawaii, um, in, uh, I think October, the week of October 22nd. And it's for entrepreneurs and it's how to, um, improve your entrepreneurship, your business, your company, uh, through mind, body, and spirit. So I'm like a really good candidate to speak there because I'm entrepreneurial and I'm involved with the mind, body, and spirit work. So I guess that's why I got selected. It's kind of cool when they got a book part of it and then you write a book. So mine's titled Living Rad and Loving Contagiously. All right. With all that as introduction, Living Rad, what I decided, at least for that book that it meant, is that living rad is just living full out. Okay. It's living radically. It's doing whatever you want, wherever you want, whenever you want, with whoever you want, all those kinds of whoever you want. It's just being freedom. It's being untethered. It's being loving. It's being bold, courageous, adventurous, uh, all those kinds of things. But I decided that living rad is really about continually improving your life. Or as the Japanese would say, Kaizen. And early in my Exxon career, Exxon got involved like most corporations did in the quality movement. You know, Dr. Demings was huge. In fact, I got to see him and take uh, managers to uh, see him, I think three or four times. Really cool. One of my favorite people in the history of the world. If you don't know Dr. Edwards Deming from Wyoming, he was a statistician and he literally changed the um, the whole country of Japan, I believe, um, into an industrial powerhouse um, many years after World War II. The U.S. sent him over there to help them rebuild the country. And he was a statistician and developed statistical process control and the Deming or Schuert cycle. And uh, uh, there was a, a famous 60-minute uh, episode, probably back in the 70s, and it was comparing how uh, Toyota was doing because they were up and coming at that time versus General Motors and Ford, who were the dominant uh, um, automobile companies in the world at that time. And it was so interesting. The thing that I remember was that at that time, when they uh, uh, went and studied each of those automobile factors, Ford was making think it was 12 cars per person per, I don't know what time period, day, month, year, <clears throat> 12. General Motors was making 13 and Toyota was making 60. And so they went to investigate, you know, how did that happen? What are they doing? And it was so fascinating because um, they showed the Japanese and they talked about their quality of movement and their use of robotics. And if you think about it with robotics, it's kind of cool because you can, well, it's not cool for people, but you can replace people with robotics. And uh, back then, robotics were probably just starting, so they weren't as great, but that's what um, they did. And it's so fascinating because Ford and General Motors got to be part of this study and see what was going on, and they saw different things. So General Motors saw that Toyota had had created this um, these factories with all these robotics, and that's how they were able to have such a great um, score or metric here with uh, 60 automobiles per person per time period. 
and they were at 13. So over the next five years, General Motors invested $40 billion into their factories to modernize them, so to robotize them. That's the right word. Ford saw something different. They saw what they what the Japanese had done was to implement quality principles. And they had hired Dr. Demings and um, Ford said, we're going to do that. And they hired Dr. Deming away from the Japanese and came back and, and um, Dr. Deming started working with Ford. And that's where you might remember, those of you old enough, the commercial Ford, and then they go, where quality is number one. That came from Dr. Deming. So over the next five years, they invested in their people, into training, into continuous improvement. 60 Minutes went back five years later to see how everyone was doing. So they first went to Toyota, and Toyota went from 60 cars per employee per unit to 72. So they just kept getting better. Ford, um, because they had hired um, Dr. Deming, they went from 12 cars per employee to 25. So they had more than doubled, still way below what the Japanese were doing, but they had doubled. And then the interesting thing was General Motors, who spent $40 billion in robotics, into modernizing their factories, they went from 13 cars per employee per time unit to 12. I mean, that's just fascinating to me. And General Motors saw that, and then they hired Dr. Deming away from Ford. And now all the the car manufacturers and a lot of manufacturing in the U.S. and and worldwide has adopted many of the principles from Dr. Deming and his um, uh, people that came after him. It's it's really, really kind of cool. But this concept of continuous improvement, um, Kaizen, is just... It's just an amazing concept because we don't think about that. Or some people do. Some people don't. And I remember reading a book um, because I later became Exxon's uh, Continuous Improvement Advisor, CIP, Continuous Improvement Process Advisor. And uh, so I got to to study all this cool stuff, Lean and Six Sigma and re-engineering and whatever else came up and got to then implement it into the Exxon world. It seems like it's a little bit harder to implement into a, a process um, where we're, you know, we're making oil. Uh, we're not producing a widget, a car, a, uh, a transistor. Um, but we implemented, and I, I think we made the company a lot better. But I remember, that, remember reading this book called American Samurai. That was another one of those books that was really meaningful to me. American Samurai, it's not popular like Steam Prophecy, but it was uh, directed toward businesses. And it was about this samurai, American samurai that went over to Japan Japan and saw what they were doing and then brought it back to the U.S. and implemented it in their company. And, you know, it explains all the CIP principles and it was really kind of cool. Don't remember much of it other than American Samurai, Continuous Improvement, Kaizen. And that's what I wrote about in my book that uh, Live and Rad is about continually improving. And so I have been doing that, I think, most of my life. And maybe you have too, but I'm doing it consciously now. So in fact, when I went to my very first Tony Robbins event, um, where I didn't even know who Tony was, but by the end of it, I was like in, and then I hired my first life coach. I didn't even know there was something called life coach, but I hired this guy named Chad Cooper, who was just absolutely amazing. He was uh, Tony's kind of top coach who was working with most of the athletes. So even though Tony gets credit for working with Monica Sellas and uh, um, Andrew Agassi and resurrecting both their careers, um, as well as a bunch of major league baseball players, um, Chad did a lot of the work because Tony could work with him maybe once or twice, maybe four times a year. I don't know. But Chad worked with everyone for, you know, weekly. And I got lumped into that. Uh, world of coaching with Chad because I was a college track coach. And so lucky me. Anyway, Chad taught me a lot of things. And um, 
a lot of it was around just continuous improvement and mindset and using what I called, he called, juicy and delicious names. And so I have really taken that to another level that uh, I'll talk about another another time. But when I spoke about September 7th and uh, the passing of my dad, um, after that, my mom lived in Phoenix and I was in California and uh, she was just you know, just devastated from uh, my dad's death. They had been together since they were 19 years old when they met in an automobile factory in, in Hungary and uh, fell in love and uh, created this um, life in America. And my mom was very introverted. She was an artist. Uh, she didn't really know, doesn't really know anyone or didn't know anyone outside of the home. She just kind of took care of it. Her house was immaculate. You could eat off the garage floor. It was white. And she just kept everything beautiful. And uh, and I just adored her and loved her. And so um, I would uh, fly to Phoenix every week um, for almost a year, I think, to be with her Monday through Friday. And then my sister would take uh, uh, Friday through Sunday or so just to be with her. And uh, one of the things that she liked was this TV show called Dancing with the Stars. So I watched TV with her and I started watching Dancing with the Stars. It's a pretty cool show. I didn't think I would like that. I'm not a dancer. I was the guy that was always afraid to dance. And, you know, I rarely went to, if ever, a dance in high school. I was just too afraid, too too scared to talk to a girl, too to you know, self-conscious to all those kinds of things back then. And I'm not that so much anymore, but I was for most of my lifetime, actually. Anyway, I I watched that dancing with stars and I was just fascinated that these these pros would bring in these really klutzy people mostly and they would work with them a long and hard time and they would turn them into in these incredible dancers. And there was a guy named Derek Huff. Some of you might know him. He's a pretty cool dude. In fact, I met him. I danced with him and his sister, Julianne, at Date with Destiny one year because they were really close to me. Uh, they're into uh, uh, Tony Robbins. And I think it, uh, it's what makes them great dancers or part of the strategy. Anyway, I decided I wanted to be like Derek Huff one day. <laughs> um, and so this was like, 13 years ago or so, um, close to 14 years or so ago. And uh, last um, last year or so, I started uh, to take some dance lessons with uh, um, the person that I was dating at that time. And uh, um, we, we broke up shortly after I bought 20 more lessons. <laughs> <laughs> so in January, when I moved to uh, Naples, I remembered I have um, lessons still at uh, this dance studio, uh, Let's Dance With Me. Yeah, that's the name of it. And again, I'm not a dancer. I'm kind of robotic. I wanted, though, to grow and I wanted to put myself out there. And so I went and asked them about it and they said, yeah, we've got a female dance instructor that can dance with you since you don't have a partner. And so I started dance lessons in like, I don't know, March or April or so. And it was fun. Um, I was going to do my lessons. And then they talked me into um, dancing at this in this showcase in December, December 16th in um, Naples. And I go, okay, that sounded cool. But I didn't think about that I'm mostly not in Naples because I, I had uh, I bought a, a small condo here and it was going to be remodeled. Initially, they told me two months. Now it looks like it's like five months. And I went over there today and it doesn't look like they've done anything in the last two months. So I have been taking dance lessons mostly on Zoom, which doesn't work all that well. You can work a little bit on mechanics, but there's no, no substitute for being in person. So I'm here in Naples and actually had two dance lessons. I've got another one this afternoon and then I'm leaving uh, for another month um, and we'll be doing Zoom lessons. But it's a little bit nerve wracking to think that uh, you're going to be dancing in front of these these people that are going to be watching you. And me, an introverted, shy uh, guy that doesn't dance, um, I put myself out there. 
That is living rad. You know, some people say when you're afraid of something, that's when you have to do it. And this qualifies. I I am really afraid of dancing, afraid of what people will think about me. That's a terrible mindset, isn't it? I'm really working on that one. And this is just one of the processes that I'm using to uh, uh, put myself out there to say, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to be like Derek Cuff. At least in my mind. So I'm using visualization techniques. I'm using vibration, uh, law of attraction, everything that I could think of to uh, uh, not embarrass myself in my showcase on December 16th. Coming back to Live and Rad. Oh, I forgot something when I was talking about the MLM story with Matt and Cliff. One of the things that I learned. And both Cliff and Matt told me this, is that network marketing is really just personal development with an opportunity attached. And if you think about it, it's like so true. If you want to do personal development, you can go to all the workshops you want. And I I go to a lot of them. But in network marketing, you are doing it for like real. It's like in a workshop, you're practicing with your buddy, your partner, and you go away and you practice it and you do it and then you might forget about it. But in network market, you have to be doing it, practicing it, perfecting it all the time because you have to call up someone or send them a voice message or talk to them in a group and say, hey, um, I'm involved with this really cool new uh, travel company. Are you interested in taking a look at it? Because I'm traveling all over the world. And, and most people say no. <laughs> and so you have to get used to people saying, no, I don't want that. Stay away from me. It's a pyramid scheme, all these things. And you go, but, but, hey, Tony told me it's like really cool and everyone should be in one. And this is the one you should be in because I'm in it and you need to be underneath me. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's hard to get started. Because you don't know what to do. You're not confident. You're not confident in yourself. You're not confident in your product. You're not confident in the business model. And you have to develop all those things. And I remember Matt kind of coaching me um, on this. And uh, and actually, he got a, I got a six-hour coaching session with Matt Morrow at uh, um, this pool in Monte Carlo on our um our, uh, what was that, car rally around Europe. <laughs> that was just crazy. But he said, you know, you've got to learn how to make friends, how to talk to people, how to have confidence. Even if you don't, you've got to fake it. You've got to develop it. You've got to believe so much in yourself, in the company, in the product, in the business model, that it comes out, it exudes from you. And truthfully, by doing that, it's the best way to actually do personal development. Forget about any money that I may have made in Live or Savvy or iFast or what's that other thing I'm involved with? I can't even remember what it is. <laughs> Fintouch. Um, and I did make money in all of them. Not, you know, a million dollars a month like I thought I was going to. Um, but that's another story why I exited them. It has more to do with... Uh, my corporate beliefs and uh, not understanding the business model. But I did really good for quite a while in all of them, which was really kind of cool. And the best part of it was the personal development. It helped me become a better speaker because prior to uh, Tony Robbins and network marketing, I could not do a podcast like this, quite truthfully. My mouth would be all cotton mouth. I would be sweating. I would be shaking. I would be going like, ah! I say what do I say yet somehow now I know what to say and I attribute that a lot to truthfully network marketing it made me a better person because I had to be um, in order to be successful that's living rad too so living rad means a lot of things I still come back to it means uh, continually improving yourself but that's what my process, my journey with um, with uh, Live and Rad, with uh, Live dot Rad and network marketing, uh, really truly was. So for those of you out there that have never been involved with one, go try it. 
find something or just be open to when something really cool pops up and you go, ho, 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 my uh, antennas are on. I'm, Robert said now, and Tony told him, find something. Everyone should be in one, something that you're passionate about and something that's early on. I'm not sure that's really true now, but it's, it mostly is true because <laughs> that was my problem was when they're in pre-launch, things don't always go smoothly. Uh, there's all sorts of problems. And that's why it's called pre-launch because they're working through those issues. I didn't know that. I come from the Exxon world where if you're not number one or number two in the world, you're divested. You get sold. And there were plenty of things that weren't working in Live and, and then later Savvy. Um, and with Savvy... I think after two or three months, uh, Matt and Cliff and I and uh, Kenna, who was underneath, we were like the best. Uh, we were doing amazingly. We were all in the top 50 uh, um, promoters um, of the company out of 20,000, mostly women. Three of us were guys and we were like in the top 20. There were, there were weeks where I was the number one enroller in the whole company. <laughs> And actually, after a while, it got really easy to do. I would just reach out to people and say, hey, I'm involved with this women's athleisure where it wasn't even men's. I wasn't passionate about it, but all the women I knew were passionate. It's like a Lululemon kind of company, but about 30% less. And every every woman just was passionate about it. So I got involved with it. That's why I have so many female friends now from Facebook, because that was their strategy. ATM, ad tag message. It's a pretty good process. And I would just add people, tag them, message them, and say, hey, um, you look like someone I'd like to partner with in this cool business I'm involved with. Um, are you open to taking a look? And that was it. But it was the tone that I said it. And people said, sure, I'm open. And then you add them to this Facebook group. You tag them in a couple messages. And then you follow up and say, hey, side that you took a look at these couple messages, or did you take a look at them? Or I hope you took a look at them. What'd you like best? And you don't say, you want to join me? You say, what'd you like best? And they say, I like the clothes or I like the money. I like the opportunity. I like the community, whatever it is. And then you just talk with them. And before you know it, they go, yeah, I think I'm going to try this. And they do. And people sign up. It's kind of cool. And you get better and better as you develop more confidence. Anyway. That's living rad too, is finding something you're passionate. I spoke about that in our last podcast, Passion. And I think that uh, that's a huge part of, of living rad. Being always, always, always continually improving yourself. So now there's seven um, levels, not levels, elements, I'll call them maybe, of my life plan that I'm looking to continuously improve. The first one is physical body. Because if your physical body's not doing well, you're not doing well. And then because of Chad Cooper, remember that was my first life coach, he taught me juicy and delicious names. And it didn't take very long for me to kind of come up with my juicy and delicious name for my physical body. And that's the Hungarian Stallion. <laughs> and it ties into uh, uh, the movie Rocky. Do, 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 the Italian stallion, so I'm the Hungarian stallion. That song is my alarm and my ringtone and everything else and the word Hungarian stallion. And every time I hear it, see it, I get a little bit more puffy. I run an extra mile. I do an extra set, whatever it might be. It really helps me. On my calendar, instead of it saying, you know, 5 a.m. exercise. I don't exercise at 5 a.m., but I could have in my older days. I probably did. No, I did. Um, I might put on my calendar exercise. Now it's Hungarian stallion time. So I'm using, I'm taking advantage of that juicy and delicious name everywhere I can. And so I've got, I created a painting or a set of paintings that are in my, uh, my uh, bedroom right across from when I wake up and I see all my juicy and delicious names and it gets me going. It's part of my life plan. It's part of my vision. It's part of my attraction. It's part of what I do. It's part of living rad. And I do suggest you think about this. And for you, you know, I, this is ratitude. Um, I would just come up with your own crazy name for whoever you are. If your last name is Smith, call it Smithitude or um, 
acid, acid dude, or whatever it is that you want to come up with, come up with something cool for you. Don't make it mine. Make it yours. That's the part of living rad is make it your own. I'm just sharing these stories. I'm just sharing my experiences because you have them too. And I'm wanting you to wake up, to grow, to continually improve yourself and to come up with some juicy and delicious names and to think about what you think about. Become conscious of your unconscious. And as you do this, you're going to be living Smith or whatever your name is. And that's what you're really interested in, right? So the second element is around emotions and meanings. And this one has shifted a lot for me. Um, but now I'm the divine child. I think in a previous podcast, I actually talked about these things. So I don't want to be repetitive, but I'm just going to list them out uh, without going into them too much. But they're juicy and delicious names. That's the key is, and you can come up with your own. So that's around meanings of life, meaning about your words. Mine is a divine child. The third one is around time management. And that one is morphed over time from quantum creator to, I can't remember, something with flow. And now my latest is aligned in vortex that comes from the abraham hicks world because about alignment and you know linkedin so it's aligned in and vortex is the vortex we're in where i'm vibrating high attracting all sorts of great things into life the fourth one is around relationships so i'm a conscious king i read this this uh, uh short post once about what a conscious king is and go that's what i want to be so i'm a conscious king Juicy and delicious. The fifth one is around your mission or your uh, drive, your purpose in life. And that one for me <laughs> right now uh, just morphed into rad guru after sad guru. And I'm not a guru, but I really like that. So these are supposed to be just things that light you up. You're not supposed to share them because you might think, eh, that quack, that idiot, who does he think he is? It's for you internally. I'm just sharing it um, to give you an idea what's juicy and delicious. That's juicy and delicious to me. The sixth one is around finances. And so my favorite song is Free Bird by Leonard Skinner. So um, my juicy and delicious name for my finance so life is free bird. And that reminds me that uh, the goal in finance that I picked up at Life and Wealth Mastery was um, to be able to do anything you want, anytime you want, anywhere you want, with whoever you want. And I think there's some more any's in there. But anyway, being free, being like free bird. And so that's that's my word for that. So when I'm doing taxes, October 15th is coming up. So I always extend my taxes because some K1s come in late. And uh, um, so rather I call it a, on my calendar tax time. Uh, who wants to do taxes? It's my free bird time. And just like I just did, um, tax time to free bird time. It, it just shifts everything. And that's, that's, that's a huge part of living rad is to live in high vibration. That's what I should have talked about, right? I'm going to change my chapter now. <laughs> the uh, seventh element is your spiritual or contribution um, to the world, um, life. And it doesn't matter whether you, what you believe in, if you're religious or spiritual or you call that your God or the universe or source or truth or inner being or little G God, whatever it is. Uh, most people have something they believe in. And, um, that has morphed over time for me too. And right now it's raid, rad, radiant light. So I want to be rad and then a light. To people around me so that I can inspire people and uh, and help them to live rad and love contagiously. So my radiant light time. So all those things wrap up into gratitude or living rad and loving contagiously. You can see I've got a lot of juicy and delicious names. In fact, I make up stuff all the time because it makes me smile or it makes the person I'm with smile. And I want you to smile because when you're smiling, probably you're vibrating higher. And when you're vibrating higher, you're attracting things to you. You become magnetized. You're able to create the life that you want. 
the life that you truly deserve because you deserve, the life that you're worthy of because you are worthy of, the life that is loving because you're loving, lovable, and loved. And in my hypnotherapy work, that's the biggest issue that I'm working with people around is that at some point in their life, someone said something, did something, caused something to that little child of yours to think that they weren't worthy or deserving or enough. And so now as adults, we have to address that. We have to uh, heal our wounded child. And if we keep healing that, um, and we keep moving forward, we eventually get to that divine child. Remember, I use that as my juicy and delicious name for emotions and meetings. So that divine child has gone back to when you were first uh, um, born and maybe your first couple years of life or so when you were just filled with wonder. So that divine child is now filled with wonder, but now that child is full of wisdom, but the wisdom only comes from identifying what your childhood wound was and healing it. And so that divine child is important um, on your growth, on your journey, on my journey toward becoming living rad, loving contagiously, and having a ratitude life. So with that, I think I'm gonna end. I probably have a lot of stuff I could talk about, but that's good for now. And I I hope that uh, you listened this long. If you like this uh, podcast, listen to the other ones I've done and like this or share it or uh, sign up for it or something like that. Um, My business manager told me I'm supposed to be advertising for myself, (laughs) trying to get more followers, more listeners, more whatever. Um, And I look at it as, as an opportunity to inspire and influence more so that then you go do that for others and we could just create this great ball of fire, great balls of fire. Hey, join me on uh, September 23rd. Oh, this probably is going to air after that. There's a Walk for the World, uh, Joe Dispenza event. And I'm actually going to be on a cruise ship from Vancouver to Hawaii, but that's okay. I'm going to lead my uh, walking meditation on a cruise ship. So wherever you are in the world, whenever, live rad, love contagiously, and have a beautiful, beautiful life. Bye for now.